Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world, and welcome to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. As I am recording this right now, the Hope Probe from the United Arab Emirates has traversed half a billion kilometers or so towards its objective, towards Mars, taking, of course, a circuitous route, as I'm going to describe later in the video, that has allowed it to intercept the red planet. And right now, at this very moment, the probe is applying its braking thrusters, reducing its speed so that it can safely enter orbit. And it's burning almost half its fuel to accomplish this. This, and that's how fast this probe is going. So let's hope that it's successful. Otherwise, this video is going to end on a rather dour note because I'm not going to release it until I'm sure as to whether or not it, the mission has been successful or not, or at least I have a pretty good idea. Regardless, the importance of this mission cannot be overstated, and it really makes me angry, very angry, that it has not been thoroughly covered by the media, as thoroughly covered as the other two probes that are on their way to Mars as well. And I've only got one reason for this. It's coming from a Middle Eastern country that very few people have even heard of, let alone really care about, as opposed to something put out by NASA. And I'm not exaggerating here. This isn't just some token thing that the United Arab Emirates is sending out to Mars just to prove that they can do it. It's an incredibly important mission. Perhaps, at least as far as SpaceX is concerned, the most important of the three missions going to Mars. And the reason for this is because this probe is going to be the first in history to provide us with a comprehensive view of the Martian atmosphere, the different layers of the atmosphere, the qualities of the atmosphere, Atmosphere, and most importantly, the weather, the dynamics of the weather, what causes these massive dust storms that are going to be such a threat to future colonization, what causes them? Can we predict them? Might we be able to do something about them? All of these things this probe is going to provide information about for the first time in human history. No, this is not some token thing from a rich oil company or anything along those lines. This is an incredibly important scientific mission that so few people are really aware of, and that needs to change. And you know that at least those who have followed my channel. I've been following this for quite some time. This, that's why I have my computer here and my little sticker because I watched this thing take off on Space News Pod. I did it in conjunction with those folks and uh, very wonderful people, by the way. I have them linked in the description. Make sure to subscribe to them as well. But regardless, this is a very exciting moment and I'm going to know hopefully within the next half hour or so, because yes, it is a 30-minute burn, 30 minutes worth of braking thrusters in order to get the probe down to the necessary speed to enter an orbit, and an enormous amount of fuel being consumed to do this. It is a critical moment in this mission. Are they going to be able to pull it off? Well, they've put a lot of work into it, and they've had a lot of help, and I'm going to tell you as much as I can about it in the time allotted to me by your average YouTube video, and I'm going to tell you about it in just a couple moments.
I'm sure you smart people have been paying attention today, so I'm not going to keep you in suspense. The probe has successfully entered orbit, and I could not be more thrilled. And this is where everything started on the 20th of July, 2020, aboard a Mitsubishi H-2A heavy lift rocket in Japan. And by orbiting probe standards, this thing is pretty damn big. 1,350 kilograms, 800 of those kilograms being hydrazine fuel. And it got to Mars in just over six and a half months. Yes, folks, you can get to Mars in six months. And this is the long-term objective a century from now, if the UAE is to be believed. No, this is not conceptual art of Elon Elon Musk's future colony. This is what the UAE wants to build on Mars, and they're investing millions of dollars in building a mock-up of this design here on Earth. And this mock-up is going to consist of essentially self-sustaining biodomes with fuel, atmosphere, food, water, pretty much everything that a colony needs to survive. And on top of that, transparent radiation resistant panels. And all of the technology is going to be shared with the rest of the world. The UAE has big ambitions when it comes to Mars, and they're going to demonstrate how a self-sustaining colony can be maintained in the deserts of the Middle East. And when it comes down to it, this is extremely good long-range planning for the UAE, as most Middle Eastern countries are realizing, or at least they should be realizing, oil revenues are not going to last forever. They need to look elsewhere to continue their economic growth. By the way, have a look at those stacked gardens there on the right. You may have seen those in some of my other videos when I'm talking about producing enough food for a large self-sustaining colony on Mars and the amount of food that can be produced by artificial methods. Anyway, these guys are going to be experimenting with that here on Earth. Earth. And here's an example of that, by the way. This obviously is not on Mars, but this is a very, very good idea on the UAE's part to ensure that their country continues to grow economically beyond oil revenues. And that revenue can be found not only on Mars, but also in the asteroid belt. But getting back to the basics of the HOPE mission, I'm going to take you back to one of my older videos several months ago where I allowed the mission team to describe their project rather than trying to do it myself. So let's get the Wayback Machine going to this previous video and check it out. Now, I may make a few comments, but for the most part, I'm going to let the mission team describe their project. Although their major partner is my alma mater, the University of Colorado, so I may have a couple things to say. Mars is a mysterious planet that has always fascinated people on Earth. We still have plenty of unanswered questions. For instance, we know there is water on Mars, but only in the form of ice and vapor. Water can't exist on Mars as liquid because the atmosphere has become too thin. Oxygen and hydrogen, the building blocks of water, are being lost into space. We also know that Mars has some exotic weather, like massive dust storms, similar to those on Earth, which are more brief and localized. On Mars, the dust storms can engulf the entire planet and rage on for months. Our science mission is to produce the first ever truly global picture of the Martian atmosphere. This is the first holistic study of the Martian climate and how the layers of its atmosphere fit together. We will model the connections between all the different components of the Martian climate, including all the temperatures, winds, dust and clouds. Scientists on Earth will use the data that will be sent by the probe to build a complete dynamic picture of the Martian climate. This is something that has never been seen before. Our data will give the international science community a deeper and richer understanding of the Martian atmosphere. First, this... We will share the data freely with more than 200 universities and research institutes around the world. This is our contribution to human knowledge. We want the orbiter to arrive at Mars in 2021. 
the UAE's 50th anniversary. 100,000 kilometers per hour. Then the spacecraft will separate from the launcher. It will unfold the solar panels and point the spacecraft toward the sun to charge the batteries. The journey across the solar system will take around seven months. As it travels, the spacecraft needs to figure out its location. There is no GPS in deep space. So the spacecraft will use star trackers to navigate using patterns of constellations. This is similar to the way our ancestors used the stars to find their way in the desert and at sea. This is the point where orbiters usually get lost, so they'll have to be really precise. When the spacecraft gets close to Mars, it'll have to use its thrusters as brakes. It'll need to slow down to 14,000 kilometers per hour to enter orbit. This will be a tense time at mission control in the UAE. The thrusters must fire for 30 minutes at precisely the right time. If anything goes wrong, the spacecraft will pass Mars and the mission will fail. Both we and the Russians have had this happen to us. But we can't control the spacecraft in real time from Earth. When it's so far away, signals can take more than 14 minutes to arrive. Its brain will be sophisticated enough to make its own decisions. Look back in history. The Middle East was once a powerhouse for innovation and science. Muslim civilizations were once pioneers in mathematics and astronomy. This will be the first ever Arab Islamic mission to another planet. The Emirates Mars mission will have a major impact and a legacy here in the UAE. That's because of the approach that we took to planning and building this mission. The easy way to do it would have been to go and buy technologies and expertise from big space agencies and companies. We decided to do That's one reason I'm so proud and excited to be part of the mission as an Emirati and as an Arab. It's very symbolic for an Arab and Muslim country to launch an interplanetary mission. We have taken a step beyond just looking at the skies. We are going there. I think it will change the way young people look at their region. It will help us think positively and see hope and opportunity. If a small young Arab nation is able to reach Mars, truly anything is possible. This is a huge moment for a small nation. I have to admit, I am fired up. At the time when this promotional video came out, this mission seemed like a dream. But sure enough, the H-2A on July 20th took the probe up into orbit, and the second stage was actually able to reignite once the probe was properly aligned to send it on its way to Mars. And by the way, the final speed that it was able to achieve was pretty mind-blowing. I mean, we're talking about 121 thousand kilometers per hour on its way to Mars, and it covered a huge total distance. As I mentioned before, nearly half a billion kilometers. And by the way, I'm not going to pretend that I can read Arabic. Now, the orbital process is far from over. Currently, the probe is, is in what's called a capture orbit that's going to take the probe as close as a thousand kilometers from the surface of Mars. Talk about crazy close. And as far away as almost 50,000 kilometers. But once it settles in to its proper orbit, it's going to be anywhere from 20,000 to 43,000, as you can see here. And once this orbit is established, the probe will be able to study the planet in the infrared on the left, take high resolution photographs in the center, or ultraviolet on the right. It has instruments for all of these things, and it will transmit all of this information back to the UAE via the deep space network at NASA. So this probe has the ability to study the atmosphere and the surface of Mars in ways that no other orbiting probe has ever been able to do and this information will be shared with the rest of the world as I have already mentioned. This is the UAE's contribution to science. 
And I'll tell you, this probe is well equipped to do its job. First of all, it has what's called the Emirates Mars Infrared Spectrometer, or the EMIRS, and specifically, it looks at the thermal state of the lower atmosphere, the geographical distribution of dust, water vapor, and ice, as well as a three-dimensional thermal structure of the Martian atmosphere. It gives a very, very good picture of the lower atmosphere and its relationship with the upper atmosphere. Secondly, it's equipped with the EXI, or the Emirates Exploration Imager, and this is a high-resolution 12-megapixel camera capable of studying the lower atmosphere of the red planet in visible and ultraviolet bands. Obviously, it can capture high-resolution images of Mars, but it can also measure the optical depth of water ice in the atmosphere and measure the column abundance of ozone. And then, of course, visible images of Mars during atmospheric events like dust storms. So we can really study the atmosphere of Mars, because right now, our understanding of the Martian weather is not that great. This probe is really going to change all of that for the better. And whoops, I almost forgot the Emirates Mars Ultraviolet Spectrometer, or EMUS, and this is designed to focus on the upper atmosphere, the thermospheric and exospheric regions of the atmosphere, or 100 to 200 kilometers and above. We'd like to think that there's nothing up there because the Martian atmosphere is so thin, but that's not actually the case. There's quite a lot going up there that we really don't understand and this is designed to detect the ultraviolet emissions of hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon monoxide, and the spectral resolutions are chosen in order to distinguish between the emissions of interest from other bright emissions, in order to resolve carbon monoxide emissions, but more importantly, how does Mars lose its oxygen, and how did it turn from such a favorable planet for life into the cold desert that it is today? Day. We still really don't understand that. So why is understanding the atmosphere and the weather so important to SpaceX? Well, you're looking right at it dust storms. And I'm not talking about blocking out solar panels. In my opinion, that's the smallest threat that dust storms represent. In a study called Dust in the Atmosphere of Mars and its Impact on Human Exploration, which was put out by the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, dust storms have been shown to be not only poisonous because of the perchlorates, but also electrostatically charged, which can lead to lots of problems. I quoted this study before, but those videos don't get a whole lot of views, so here we go again. Quote, the Martian atmosphere is the origin of many possible hazards to both humans and equipment. The unknown thermodynamic properties of the bulk gas fluid, including unexpected turbulence in the near surface boundary layer, represent risk during vehicle entry and descent and landing. Also, major dust storms may affect EDL and adversely affect a human explorer's ability to perform extravehicular activities. The study goes on to warn that the tribal electric qualities of Martian dust storms can give rise to large electric fields which may prove hazardous to both explorers and equipment, including effects very similar to lightning as you're seeing right there. That's not just an artist's license. On top of that, since ele it's electrostatically charged, Martian dust can also be abrasive and it can adhere to equipment. The study says, quote, abrasive properties of dust accumulating on surfaces and penetrating systems could lead to failure of air generation and delivery, carbon dioxide removal, fire detection causing false alarms and suppression, EVA suits, rovers, windows, visors, and optics, including the possibility of critical life support systems completely failing. And it also bears mentioning that Martian dust devils, which are far more common than Martian dust storms, can also be hazardous in many of the same ways. It is vitally important 
that we understand these phenomena, that we understand the Martian atmosphere and the Martian weather. And thanks to the achievements of this young group of people and their triumphant accomplishment today and what they hopefully will achieve over the next several years as HOPE operates in orbit around Mars, we are going to be able to learn the things that are necessary to protect future colonists against what I think is one of the greatest hazards that the Red Planet has to offer. And finally, and perhaps the most importantly, I would like to mention that one third of this team was made up of young Emirati women, including many of them in prominent management positions in an area of the world where everybody seems to think that women are not treated with respect women were given the spotlight on one of the most important scientific projects in the history of this country. Well done, UAE. And so, a few hours ago, the Burj Khalifa lit up like a beacon, heralding forth a new age in the Middle East, a new age in space technology and exploration, a new era for Mars, and also a beacon of hope. This probe was called hope for a lot of different reasons, but most importantly, to give hope to young Arabs across the Middle East, many of which, millions of which are suffering, impoverished, or possibly finding themselves in the middle of a civil war and who feel just as hopeless as one can imagine. And yet there is hope. Today, the UAE gave the Middle East hope. And I hope that this is something that is not forgotten anytime soon. So clearly I'm in a much better state than I was during my first recorded uh, introduction that I had when I really wasn't sure what was going to happen and I had my fingers crossed, but I am beyond elated right now. Congratulations to the UAE. Congratulations to this group of talented young people who managed to accomplish this amazing task because space is hard Getting to Mars is even harder, and they did it, or at least hopefully they did. There's still a number of things that need to be ironed out as the vessel settles into orbit, the satellite does rather, that sort of thing, but still, I expect huge things out of the HOPE orbiter very soon, and I can't wait to see it. At the same time, though, being the angry astronaut, I can't help but be pissed off because I really feel that this particular mission just didn't get anywhere near the attention that their, its American counterpart got or even the Chinese mission, and it should have. And in my opinion, it's only for one reason, because we don't expect good news out of that region. The media doesn't like to give us good good news from the Middle East. Instead, we like to think of it as a place of terrorism and war and killing and civil wars and extremism and that sort of thing, when really the vast majority of the people who are there are people who just want the best for their families, for their children, and would love to see their children go to work on a project just like this. And it's time for our perspective here in the West to change as far as that's concerned. And I've been on this soapbox before when it comes to this particular mission, but a lot of you folks haven't seen those older videos, so I decided I would say it one more time. But none of that you know, none of that does anything to calm down my elation, to make me any less happy about this. Congratulations again to the UAE. And if you like channels that cover 
not so well known missions such as this as thoroughly as I try to do, well, it's all in the description. You know how to support me, and that's all I'm going to say about that. So until we see the results of the Hope Expedition, all the amazing things that it's going to bring to the scientific world and the practical things that it's going to bring to colonists who head to Mars in the future, who, by the way, if the UAE gets its way, that's going to include a lot of Emiratis as well, and I think they're going to make very good neighbors for SpaceX colonists. I urge all of you to stay angry about space.